Okay. Hello, everyone. I think we can start. Uh, this session will be about Drupal security, and I termed it Cracking Drupal because I will show you some common exploits and mistakes that you can make on your Drupal site so that it gets insecure. Uh, my name is Klaus Burer. I'm working at Epico, a small Drupal shop in Austria, as a software engineer and also as a systems administrator. I am a member of the Drupal security team, and I also do a lot of code reviews on Drupal.org in order for people to get their project published as full projects. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter, and uh, this is my blog. And without further introduction, um, let's uh, get to some security basics that are good to understand how to protect yourself on your site. So I think the most important thing is trust. You have to define trust on a Drupal site. Um, in Drupal, you usually do that with user roles, so you have to know um, who is able to do what on your website. For example, administrators, what do they need to do? What do they have to do? Which permissions can you take away from them? And so you have to clearly define what are anonymous users allowed to do and authenticated users. And that gets you a good baseline, um, what can be done on a website and who is going to do what. And there's the principle of least privilege. I already mentioned it, basically. So you lock down um, all permissions as far as possible. Only regular, regular tasks that are performed every day on a website, there should be permissions and that should be assigned to users and everything else that is not needed should be locked down and just ruled out for any vulnerabilities. And there also comes the defense in depth um, pattern into play so that you have uh, a multiple layer of, of protections on your website. So you are not only protecting, for example, your um, menu entries, your path entries where your sites can be reached, but you're also protecting your files on the server, um, your web server configuration and other things that I will talk about today. And I think the most important thing, um, one cannot mention that often enough, is do your software updates and do them regularly because there can be security exploits for your server, for Drupal itself, for PHP, even for your browser. Yes, uh, please update your browser. Don't use an insecure Internet Explorer 6 browser because it has known vulnerabilities and weaknesses um, that can be exploited by attackers. We will get back to that later. And I did my talk according to the OVASP top 10. It's the Open Web Application Security Project, which is a loosely coupled group of people that try to define um, the risks of security weaknesses. That they try to do an assessment of the attack vectors and also of the impact of security vulnerabilities. And they describe that with examples and with resources. So it's uh, really a good documentation how you should protect your site and what vulnerabilities are out there and how they can be exploited. So I really highly recommend to take a look at that list, which I'm, or, which I'm also going to talk to you about today. <clears throat> so um, the first thing is uh, injection. That's at the top of the list. It's not that much of a high problem in Drupal itself, so we don't have many SQL injections because um, developers mostly know how to use the database API correctly. But just for completeness, I put up an example here, how it can be exploited. Basically, you have some query function in your framework in Drupal, it's the dbquery function, that you pass an SQL string, and instead of using named parameters here as you should do it, something from the request, for example here from the um, query parameters of the URL, is directly concatenated into that string, and that string is then handed off to the database system. And the database system cannot differentiate anymore what from that um, string is user provided and which was hard coded by the programmer, so it just executed it. And the typical exploit for this would be an example URL like that. So you're visiting some site and you're setting that get parameter to some delete query, for example. And what MySQL then does, it executes two queries. First, the select query, which should just, um, just end with a semicolon. And then you add a second query after that. And that's basically your exploit. And people can do all kinds of nasty stuff in your database. They can drop tables, they can select data, they can delete rows, uh, whatever. And this would be the correct usage and how you can prevent SQL injection. Just use the API functions as they are supposed to be used. And that is by using named parameters with a DB query function. But Drupal 7 also has um, a query builder where you can build the fields and the conditions of your query in an object-oriented manner. And that um, uses named parameters automatically for you, so if you're using that, you are safe. And there's this um, Drupal security handbook on Drupal.org 
I highly recommend it um, to you to read it, and it also has examples about SQL injections and other problems that you can run into as a developer on your Drupal site. So, yeah, I think that's clear. But there's also remote code execution as an in injection example. So Drupal was doing that for a very long time. People have shifted away from it, but what we were basically doing is you can put some PHP code into some form. For example, should that block be uh, visible on the site, and you can put some PHP snippets in some block configuration form. Very, very, very bad idea. Please don't do that anymore. There's the PHP module. It's still in core. I think it's not in core anymore for Drupal 8. But just don't use that functionality because it's not only a security risk. It's also a pain point for maintenance because you don't know where that code lives that is executing that visi visibility of your block, for example. That would be the eval function in, in, in PHP that just um, executes some arbitrary strings that you get from somewhere as PHP. And if you do that, yeah, then you're very open to remote code execution where attacker can execute any PHP and do all kind of stuff with your site. But there are also more subtle, interesting exploits like with the unserialize function or with preg replace. So never pass um, user-provided text to unserialize with, without um, checking it before or don't lose the preg replace function with the slash e modifier because there are um, remote code execution exploits possible possible with that as well. And those are high impact vulnerabilities, which means if an attacker finds out about this, they can do anything with your site. They can take it down, they can use it as a spam relay, they can um, delete stuff, they can read sensitive customer information data out of your database. It's, yeah, that's really high impact. It's also the reason why this is the number one priority on the OWASP top 10 list. Yeah. Um, the second point is authentication and sessions. So a lot of that is covered by Drupal Core already pretty well. So what you should do is choose good passwords, for example. Don't use short passwords because they, um, they can be reverse engineered very easily. Hash your passwords, um, Drupal Core does that for you, and protect your session IDs. And how do you protect the session IDs? Well, you, use, you have to use HTTPS for all your uh, authenticated users. You can use HTTP for unauthenticated content because they don't, the HTTP request from anonymous users don't contain the session cookie which has the secret session ID. But for authenticated users, as you know, HTTP is a stateless protocol and they have to transmit some information who they are, which is the session ID. That should be encrypted because somewhere along the line from the request from your browser to your website, there can be some attackers sniffing that. So yeah, you should protect your authenticated users with HTTPS. There are some modules that help you with that, for example, the secure pages module or the secure login module, so that you can define on which pages there should, should be HTTP or whether authenticated users are always redirected to HTTPS and so forth. Uh, the third point is uh, cross-site scripting. This is the most common vulnerability that we see in Drupal core and in Drupal contributed modules because it's so easy to overlook. And the basic attack vector is this. Um, somebody can, can inject script tags on your website, for example, by posting a command or by publishing a note. And when that node is displayed and um, transferred to the browser, the browser just simply executes that script tag. So you always have to make sure that you sanitize all output that you print to, to HTML so that there are no uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And for that, for that to work, you need um, administrative user interaction, which means if the attacker has placed the script tag, somebody has to go there and visit it so that the JavaScript is um, executed. So the attacker cannot directly exploit that by just visiting the website or doing something nasty with the website, as we saw with the SQL injection, but they have to wait until an administrative user or a higher privileged user visits that site, and then it makes sense for ex to execute the JavaScript for the attacker. And here's a reflected uh, cross-site scripting example where we just print some text on a website, for example, and we want to print out the page number, so we just concatenate the current page number for a URL. Don't do that. This is a cross-site scripting attack because anything that comes from the request or from the query parameters or from some stored content in the database is user-provided text, and that needs to be sanitized. And the typical penetration test to, to 
uh, check your websites against such vulnerabilities is you put this, uh, those script tags in all form elements and in, in URL parameters that you are suspicious about that they are not sanitized correctly and then you get fancy JavaScript pop-ups all over the place if you're doing something wrong because the alert function in JavaScript that creates a, a simple pop-up and it's easy to check if you're vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. And yeah, that was the reflected case, but also the persistent cross-site scripting um, vulnerability is a dangerous thing. So in this code example, I don't know if you can read that really good because I created my slides in the wrong aspect ratio because I didn't realize that there were um, there's, there are these widescreen beamers, but yeah, anyway. Um, you have some nodes in your database and nodes are user-generated content. What does that mean for you as a developer? All things that you print from that node to HTML you have to sanitize. And in this example, um, the developer is not doing that. Um, he or she is just adding the, the note with the note ID and the title to some rows in, in some table that is uh, put into a render array and rendered later. And, database, um, and tables in HTML, in the Drupal render function, they do not automatically sanitize the uh, text that is in there. So you will be vulnerable to XSS in this case. And how will you prevent that? Well, you need to use some uh, escaping functions like check plane um, to sanitize the node title. Why do I don't have to sanitize the node ID here? Because that's why I, where I always know that this is an integer. So I don't have to sanitize it because this is some database generated uh, content. It's just a number and it's not user provided. So I don't have to sanitize this. But the title, which is user provided, of course, I have to sanitize that. And we have a nice documentation page in Drupal.org that um, tells you the, all the philosophy about handling XSS and how you can prevent it. And the golden rule in Drupal is to always filter an output. So, which means when a user edits a post they created earlier, the form should contain the same things as it did when they first submitted it. Because if you would escape on input and you would um, show the form later, then you would see escaped stuff and you don't want to show that to the user. So the philosophy in Drupal is, is always to sanitize an output when you're printing to HTML and not when you're saving stuff to the, to the database. And yeah, that, that's basically the, the strategy for sanitizing stuff. If you have an URL that is the, the most restricted thing, you can run through the check URL functions, it will check the protocol, it will check if, if it's a valid URL and sanitize that. Or if you know it's plain text, then of course use check plain. If you want to print out some markup that has some styling and headers and whatnot, um, use the check markup function where you also pass a text format um, that, the use, that the current user is able to use um, to that function. That's how you handle rich text. But sometimes you don't have a text format available or it's just a general purpose function. That's where you use the general purpose filter XSS function or filter XSS admin function that strip out most dangerous tags but leave some sensible defaults in there that can be used for example strong tags or other things. And if you know it's completely trusted, which is rarely the case, you can print it out without checking. So trusted would be for example the node ID. I know that's generated by the database so that I don't have to sanitize it. How can we mitigate XSS? While I was preparing um, these slides, I tried to exploit Drupal 7 and it's actually pretty hard to do if you have a cross-site um, scripting vulnerability because Drupal sets the HTTP-only flag on session cookies. So in JavaScript, you cannot access the session cookie anymore, which is pretty interesting and I find it really nice that we are doing that. So that the typical example that you always see for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities is to um, access the cookie in JavaScript and send it to some external server of the attacker and they can then hijack your session and pose as your, under your user account and do stuff as your user account. But that doesn't work anymore. Same for passwords. There's a jQuery snippet out there how you can exploit changing the password of the current user in Drupal 6, but that doesn't work in Drupal 7 anymore because you have to input the current password before you can change it. So that's good, but still you can do a lot of damage with uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. You can create, the attacker can create new users on your behalf, give them any permission and so forth. So the important thing is to use text formats for different roles. Administrators might be able to use more tags. Authenticated users that are only allowed to do, um, to post comments should not um, be allowed to post any script tags and so forth. And the general mantra is we still need to rigorously escape user input wherever we print stuff to HTML. 
And there's also a new standard um, defined by the W3C um, called Content Security Policy. So if you think about that, the internet is, is really broken. It was designed for the Web 1.0 where um, all the content on a web page was generated by, the, by some administrator, but that's not the case anymore. Lots and lots of people post comments on your sites and they post notes on your site. So basically everything is on your site is user-generated content. And browsers just going through that content and executing any JavaScript that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And a way to protect against that is the content security policy standard where you can specify in HTTP headers which domains should be able to execute JavaScript. So if, for example, if an attacker adds script tags with the source of evil.com to load some, some JavaScript from evil.com and you fail to sanitize that, yeah? Somebody makes a mistake and that is printed directly to HTML. With the content security policy protection, the browser wouldn't execute that because obviously you haven't put evil.com into your white list of domains um, in your HTTP headers. So that's a very nice protection. It's still quite new, it's not supported by all new browser and it doesn't work on Android right now. So yeah, we are stuck with this problem that we still need to rigorously escape any user-provided input. I guess that will not change in the next years. But this is an interesting standard to look at to mitigate cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, number four on the list of the OWASP is insecure direct object references. So that would be kind of access bypass vulnerabilities in Drupal, where, for example, somebody changes an ID and a URL, and this is still able to, to change that URL, although they shouldn't be able to. And this happens rarely for Drupal because most of the time we use the user permission system and the role system and the access API, so that's not a very common attack vector for Drupal. On the other hand, um, number five on the list, security misconfiguration is a, a real issue for Drupal because you can do a lot of things wrong. For example, you shouldn't display any PHP errors on your production site. You can easily disable that in Drupal um, because you would, you would reveal information such as the path on the server where, where your website lives and you don't want to do that. You don't want to show which error occurred to give them, the attacker some information how they might be able to exploit your website, so disable error reporting so that errors are not shown in your HTML on your site. Pretty basic. Don't use the PHP filter module, I, I already mentioned it. Um, people used to be doing that a lot because it was just so convenient to put in just a PHP snippet in some form element to display blocks or to do something in your node. As I said, it's hard to maintain and it's a huge um, security issue if somebody gets access to this node and can modify it and put their own PHP code in there. Yeah, you're, you're basically screwed. So don't use it, disable that module. Um, PHP files writable by the web server, that's, that's a very interesting thing. So what you should do on your production site is remove write permissions for the web server user. On most uh, Unix systems, it's typically the WW data user. And a file layout would look like this. You have some deployer user. I call it deploy on my system, which basically uh, updates your website, fetches from Git, or is your FTP user or whatever. And the group is the WW data um, group, which is able to access your site but not write to them. And that's the important point. So everything, all files that are part of your Drupal installation are there and they cannot be modified if an attacker is able to compromise the web server user. That's important. Of course, you have to have different rules for the files directory where the web server user stores uploaded files by the user, but that is then a very limited space where the web server user has write access, so you can easily secure a site like that. Again, we are applying the strategy of defense in depth, so usually um, attackers shouldn't be able to exploit the web server, but if they do, we have a second level of protection that the files are, cannot be written by the web server user. That's the defense in depth strategy. There's also documentation, drupal.org, take a look at that. Yeah, um, permissions. So that is one important thing to configure on the Drupal site. The permission page is huge and you can assign many permissions to many roles and you have to clearly decide which roles do you trust and which roles do you not trust. And there is this restrict access flag in uh, Drupal 7 that tells you if you give that permission to that user role, that user role is able to take over your site. So that is this short description um, under, that, under that special permissions. You have to respect that. If you 
give that permission away to administer text formats, for example, an attacker can just modify the text format and use PHP or full HTML depending on your site configuration. So don't do that. But there are also some um, more obvious things. Don't use the user one account in your daily uh, work because that's the super user account in Drupal. That user account has every permission and you can take it away from that account. So that account is, is always the target of attacker. If they can steal the session of that account or do cross-site request forgery over that account, that is a, a very good target. And also some obvious things. Don't call your user one um, as admin. Just name it something else. It's there are numerous automated scripts out there that just try uh, username password combinations of admin admin or admin and 123 or whatever. So it's a precaution that, that you can easily take and will increase your security. Of course, you might argue this is sec security by obscurity. So that is of, of often criticized, but also it adds to the um, defense in depth strategy, having multiple layers of security. It's not a big deal. Change that and you will be more secure. Also, um, um, some Drupal sites use private files, and private files and temporary files should always be outside of your web server document route. So a typical um, site setup for this example.com website would look like this. You have some configuration folder, whatever you put in there. It's, it's often handy to store database credentials in there or something else. Then you have a doc route, that's where your Drupal is index.php and the modules folder and the include folder. That's where the web server is able to, to access files and execute PHP. But your private files directory um, is outside of the doc root. In this example, it's side by side with the doc root itself. Same for the temporary files directory. So the secret picture um, in that example cannot be accessed by just um, crafting some URL. Example.com slash secret picture dot PNG will not work because that request will go to the document route, and that picture is nowhere in the document route, so it cannot be simply read by accessing some URLs on your web server. Um, Drupal Zip employs um, the security in depth strategy here too, so there are also HD access files in, in that folders in case people have to use it in the document route, but it's less secure, and so you shouldn't do that. PHP file executions. So the web server, um, takes index PHP and executes it. And basically most of the time the web server is configured to do that with any PHP files. And Drupal uses the front controller pattern. So every request that arrives on your Drupal site is basically routed through index PHP with some exceptions for cron.php and update PHP, but they are not that important. And one thing that you can do on our production sites is disable any execution, execution of PHP files in subfolders. So even if the attacker is somehow capable to put some PHP file in your files directory or somewhere else, it will not be executed because you have a rule in your web server configuration that only things in the root directory, like index.php, will get executed. <coughs> so here are configuration examples for Apache and also for Nginx um, that help you protect from that. Sensitive data exposure. Um, so if you have an e-commerce website in Drupal, for example, you shouldn't store credit card data in your database unencrypted, for example, because if an attacker gets access to your database, they shouldn't, it, you shouldn't make it easy for them to read that data. Or even better, what's pretty common in Drupal land, you have some external payment provider, so you don't store the credit data at all, which is even better because it cannot get stolen then. It's at some external provider, you just have some transaction reference to that customer or whatever, and you don't have any clear um, customer-related data in clear text in your database. And again, use HTTPS for authenticated sessions so that your session cookies are not leaked and cannot be used by attackers to um, use them to get access to your site. And passwords are also pretty good handled by Drupal Core, so there's nothing really to do there. Missing level function access control. So this is an access bypass in hook menu. It's pretty trivial. So what's wrong with this is that people develop a module and they experiment with their code and the permissions do not work. So what they do, they just set access callback to true because they, yeah, they want just to try something out. And then you put the mod they put the module in production and forget to um, place permissions to that um, administrative page and then basically anyone can access that path. So an anonymous user can go to slash admin slash my module slash settings, input some stuff and submit it and no access restrictions are applied because there is no access callback. 
So always check your hook menu um, definitions to um, protect against that. And the obvious solution to this problem is to put um, a permission into access arguments and then your, your, your administrative callback is protected and no anonymous user or other authentic authenticated user can um, access this, to this page. But there are also more subtle things like um, the node access system. So the node access system in Drupal um, basically specifies that nodes of the same type might have visibil different visibility permissions. So in this example, I took some expense reports, for example, that all expense reports should only be seen by some senior staff and some expense reports are visible to authenticated users, but not all of them. And for example, I want to um, create a list of expense reports nodes. I do a database query and then after that I want to display them somehow. And the problem with this code is I have no filter in place that um, filters out the protected nodes for the current user. So what we do in Drupal to work around it is uh, add a tag to the query, the node access tag. And that's important. Whenever you query the node database table, you should um, add that node access tag because most of the time you're displaying data for, s for a certain user and that certain user might not have access to all nodes. That's how we do that. Number eight is cross-site request forgery. Um, this is pretty interesting. So I have a hook menu definition here and I have the pants module. I have pants on my website, whatever pants are, there are some data thing. And I have this callback that deletes pants. And I define the page callback, I define the page arguments, and, and I define a permission. Everything fine so far, right? And then the second function in this example is the actual page callback that takes a pants ID. And what I'm going to do when I receive a request um, at that URL, I'm just going to, lead to delete the pants. I specify the pants ID to the database and I run the execute query and everything is fine, right? So what could be wrong with um, this example? How would you exploit that? An attacker posts a comment somewhere on the internet, maybe even on your site, and they just craft this special image. I don't know if you can read that, hopefully. And the source attribute of that image is a link to your site, exactly pointing to slash my module says slash point with some ID slash delete. And how, how is that the chain of an attack? So I'm logged in as an administrator. I have the permission to delete comments. I go to that uh, comments page. Okay, my browser reads the comment and sees, oh, there's an image, I need to fetch it. So it visits that URL, sends my cookies along, because that's what browsers do. If you are authenticated against the site and the browser has a session cookie, it keeps that session cookie for subsequent requests. And one of that subsequent requests in this case is fetching an image and the browser thinks, oh, that's the domain example.com. So I sent my session cookies along. And what happens then? Drupal receives that request and says, oh yeah, I know that session, that's the administrative user account, that's okay to access that page. And then the lead query is executed and suddenly the pants are gone. So that's a problem that on get requests, and fetching an image is a get request, you shouldn't do any uh, write access to your database. You shouldn't delete stuff, you should, shouldn't update stuff. And the obvious thing to protect against uh, CSF is, of course, use forms. If a user performs a destructive action on a site, it should be done with a confirmation form. Or sometimes you can't do that for usability. For example, you want to flag something. I want to favorite that node. And of course, that's a write permission because it has to be um, stored in the database and it has to run some update query. And I don't want um, to bother users with some confirmation form that should be just an Ajax links, for example. Then you have to use security tokens in your URLs so that Drupal knows, oh, that's not just a random request, that, has been, that link has actually been generated by Drupal, has been delivered to the user, and the user has clicked on it, and I can verify that. And for post requests, always use the form API. Don't, don't read dollar post or any other PHP super globals on your own. Use the form API. It has um, cross-site request forgery protection built in, and there's also a nice uh, documentation page about that. So yeah, I already mentioned that in the beginning. Um, using components with known vulnerability is a huge mistake. Don't do that. Don't let your server, your Drupal, um, 
unmaintained, don't forget to apply security update, which means you have to have a process in your organization that you have to make time for that. You have to update your software regularly, you have to monitor security lists, RSS feeds. The Drupal security team provides um, a Twitter account, an RSS feed, a page on Drupal.org where you can get notified about all security vulnerabilities that are out there. And that's basically an easy thing to do. You just update your software, you don't have to think much about it. Of course, you have to test it because some security updates might break your code, how you interact it, but that is very rare. So the general rule is just apply the security updates. And also you should disable software components that are not used. For example, the development module, devil module in Drupal is very popular. Of course you would use that on the development side, but not on the production side. Don't use the devil module on the production side because it has PHP forms and it's just an additional attack vector on your production side. Disable all stuff that you don't need. Unvalidated redirects and forwards. So uh, in Drupal, you can do redirects with the Drupal go to function. And the same as we have seen with the cross site scripting or with the SQL injection um, repeats itself here. Something is taken from the request, for example, a query parameter or something from the database, and we just redirect there. And an example for that would be um, sl example.com slash some site, cart in this, in this example. And the target URL parameter is then populated with some malicious URL, for example, evil.com here. And that's perfect for phishing attack because that URL doesn't look too bad, right? It's, it says example.com, so that's a, tr a trusted site, so I go there and input my um, username and password, for example. <coughs> but what happens is your browser goes to example.com and then the Drupal go to happens and it redirects it to evil.com. And evil.com might be a complete copy of the, the look of your site. And then people um, input their passwords there or other sensitive information that can be then fished by attackers. And what would be correct is you always have to check if a URL is something external before you perform a redirect. Usually, um, Drupal, you would, you would only use um, relative URLs if you redirect to somewhere. For example, I want to redirect to, to slash admin slash user and you don't specify any HTTP or, or domain before that, so that will work fine. But if you take something from um, user-provided input, from the request, from the node title, or some other thing that is in the database and was user-provided, you have to make sure that's not an external URL. So that's basically the top 10 list uh, that you can have on your uh, Drupal site. And the thing you have to think about is, do you see a pattern here? And the pattern that always repeats itself don't trust any user-provided data. Don't trust the incoming request. Don't trust the URL. Don't trust nodes in your database or user accounts or taxonomy terms or whatever some user um, typed in and was then saved in your database. You have to sanitize that to protect against cross-site script forgeries or you have to make sure that you don't have open redirect vulnerabilities with that data. And the point is that attacker use uh, browser features that perform actions behind the back of some administrative user. So if, if I'm redirected to a different page, evil.com for example, the browser doesn't ask me, do you want to go to evil.com? It just performs it. That's how our, our browsers and our internet works. So in that previous um, redirect example, the browser will not uh, ask me, do you really want to go to evil.com? No, it would just go there. And a lot of things are performed um, behind the user's back. Same for cross-site scripting. The browser will just see the script tag and the browser will execute it. It will not ask you, am I allowed to execute this JavaScript here? Yes, no, no, it would just do it. And same for cross-site request forgery. It would just fetch that image. It will not ask you, should I fetch this image now? No, it will fetch the image. And yeah, the most important thing is again, attackers use known vulnerabilities, so not only you are watching the, uh, reading the security advisories, but also attackers do. And they build automated tools to just go to every Drupal site they know, every Drupal site they have from some list, and employ the same attack patterns over and over again. And some sites are not updated. And then they can easily hijack those sites and do whatever they want with them. Uh, one more thing is uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, those are pretty complicated. Um, most of the time are pretty complicated to solve. The goal of the attacker is to bring a site down or make it unresponsive, basically. And how to do that is just to execute some 
expensive actions. So the attacker is not interested in compromising data or deleting data or reading sensitive information. Their only goal is to, to um, make that sign, to, to, uh, to, to break that site. And one example from some uh, security advisory we had this year, I think, was actually a security, supposedly security improving module um, had some protection against multiple login attempts. So the thing in the module was, oh, the user tried to log in many times, so I'm just going to sleep now and delay them so that they cannot try that too often. But that's a problem because the sleep function will bind server resources on your site. And if the attacker executes that very, very often, you will get many sleeping PHP processes on your site, even if that's just a couple of seconds, but they will eat up all your server resources and your site will become um, unresponsive. Of course, denial of service also happens on, on other layers like the network layer where um, people just try to flood your network. But yeah, I'm not going to into that. This is, this is just the Drupal aspect of it. Make sure if you have expensive actions that they are only execu um, executable by users that have the permissions for that. And also, how do you recover from attack? So let's say your site was hacked. Um, what do you do next? The most important thing is to to determine what was compromised and when. And if you know when and what, you can restore the parts that have been compromised from your backup. You really should do backups. You should do backups of your server. Most of the time, this is a task that should be done by your hosting provider. But you should also do backups of your Drupal installation of the database, the files, and whatnot. If you have restored that, update all your codes. That's the first thing to do. Um, change all your passwords because you don't know which passwords might be stolen or might have been compromised, so you change that. And then you audit your code and you go for your custom modules first because um, the Drupal contributed module, they are overseen by the Drupal security team and by a wider audience, so it's very likely that your security vulnerability might be in your custom code. And after that, um, it might be important, or no, it might. It is important to find out what actually happened, and that's where you can use uh, log files, log files of the Drupal watchdog or of the web server or syslog, whatever you can get to analyze um, how that request, how that hack could happen, and how to prevent it to uh, not happen again. There are also some useful security modules out there. The security review module which checks your site configuration, for example, if the files are writable by the web server, um, that the private files directory is out of sight of your uh, doc root. It checks a lot of stuff that we had in the security misconfiguration section. There's also the paranoia modules, so we don't want to have the PHP module anywhere on your site, and other modules should also not um, eval any PHP code from that is user supplied. So that module does um, a couple of things to prevent that. There's also the SecKit module, which um, experiments with some newer um, security concept like content security policy or origin checks to protect against cross-site request forgery. Yeah, you can check it out on Drupal.org. And I think that's basically it for me. Are there any questions? Yes? So the question was, are there any tools to um, scan your log files when the attack happened or how to find, out, find it out in your log files? And there was the security breach on Drupal.org, I think it was in April or May. And what the security team did or what the Drupal.org infrastructure did was also scanning the log files. I'm not sure what tools they used, but it would be interesting to find out um, if they just used basic tools like grabbing through the log files to... I think that's whatever information you have about the attack, some maybe some page on wh which page it occurred or which, which user or from what IP address, you can, of course, grab through that, filter that log with that information and get that out. That's, I guess that's also what those tools do. It's, I think there's a hard way to automatically um, detect, to detect what, ac what actually happened on your site. I think there, yeah, there, 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 might, there are tools out there on your server that analyze your logs regularly against um, common vulnerabilities. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I forgot the name. 
Anyway, I think you can look it up. Um, a Google search should, should get you some results. More questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. So I think this is in Drupal core that after a certain amount of login attempts. Uh, yes, that's for one IP. <laughs> so, yes. So what? Um, that that's very hard to do because that's basically a denial of service. At, uh, not really a denial. A brute force attack on your site. And what people on Drupal.org, for example, do is they just block a whole country for a certain amount of time until the wave, um, um, they, until they get control over the wave of that requests, until they figure out exact IP ranges. So, for example, there was an attack from from Egypt on on Drupal.org with several IP addresses from Egypt. So, they, for a certain period of time, they just took out Egypt completely in the web server and server configuration in the firewall configuration to not serve any requests to that IPs. <laughs> and after they figured out the exact IP ranges, um, they could open the firewall up for the whole of Egypt and yeah. So that, that's basically a manual process. Uh, it's, it's hard to come by such attacks with automated tools. Of course. Like <laughs> so the question was if there is a module to I'm not sure there 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 are there are modules to block IP addresses and ranges of IP addresses. I don't know the name right now. Yes, they can. Yes. How can you get? How can an attacker get usernames and password from the site? So. Basically, what you can do, but which is annoying for users, is to force them to change their passwords regularly. But yeah, that, that's annoying for users. So I'm not sure if there's a general to solution to that. Of course, you can force more, um, more secure passwords on your registration form password so that you require that passwords are longer, that they contain whatever characters and such stuff. But yeah. So yeah, that, that's actually a good point. Of course, you can install some sort of two-factor authentication to prevent that. But that's annoying for travelers, for example. <laughs> There's no good hard rule against that, yeah. I think there was a question, yeah. What do you mean? Oh, really? Yeah, I guess it was some oversight by some person. It can happen. They are just humans, too. So, <laughs> yep. Yes. 
So the question is if we have two-factor authentication in Drupal, not in Drupal Core, and I think we're not going to do it in Drupal 8 either, but there are, there are contributed modules that you can enable on your site that have different strategies. I'm not sure of the names of those modules, but if you Google just for two-factor authentication in Drupal, you will find a couple of modules that do that for you. Because nobody has worked on it, and I guess because Drupal developers find it as annoying as Lucas does, so... It's, it's open source software and people scratch their own itches and they work on stuff that they need for their customers' project and yeah, what they think is useful. Okay. Okay, so... So the command was there is the USB key module or what was it called? U UB key. UB key? Yes. Uh, there's a module for that? There's a module for that and uh -huh. all of these UB keys plugged in in your notebook and yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. That are spam bots. So what spam bots do, they have automated scripts to, to create user accounts on your, user, on your site, and then tr they try to create some sort of content, notes, or comments on your site. And if your site is configured that it's not a, in, in a special way, that's not very common for the most basic Drupal installations, those bots fail, and then they don't do anything. You could use Honeypot to protect against um, such spam scripts um, going over your sites and reg registering users, yeah. So what you should do is basically make the registration a bit harder. You could use the Honeypot module, which is not an additional hurdle for human users, but an additional hurdle for um, automated scripts. There are also... Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there is also the, I think it's called Botcha module which has um, some additional strategies. For example, if a page is loaded, the login form is loaded, um, three seconds or five seconds, whatever you specify, have to pass before that form has to be submitted because what automated scripts usually do, um, they send a post request without uh, get, uh, or they fetching the uh, login form and then submitting it immediately without waiting a couple of seconds, which a human wouldn't do. So there are different strategies that you could try out. Oh, yeah. Oh, very good. So I guess the Honeypot module and the Botcher module have some overlap. Okay. So they use different strategies to make it harder for bots to register accounts or to log in. Okay, I think we are running out of time. I will be out there and answer additional questions if you have some. Thank you.